You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, Honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. To the Black Power Talks podcast. I'm Dr. Matsumela Odom. And I'm Dexter M. Lemwingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24 7. 2021 marks a number of milestones in the African and indigenous struggle against colonial capitalism. This year marks the 40 year anniversary of the supposed first Thanksgiving feast celebrated by Anglo settlers in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Thanksgiving has a particular place in the American colonial capitalist ideological superstructure. It was not widely acknowledged until the late 19th century. It was then, following the Civil War, that the U.S. colonial mythology began to observe Massachusetts, not Virginia, as the origins of the United States. The search for religious freedom, not a plantation economy, became the mythical origins of the U.S and thus a justification for Anglo-American settler colonialism. The English invasion of North America was only one wave of colonial assaults against African and indigenous people dating back to 1441, 480 years ago, when the first shipment of enslaved Africans was stolen from Africa and taken to Europe. Eighty years later, in 1521, Hernan Cortes extended the Spanish invasion of the Americas to Mexico. August 2021 marks the 500-year anniversary of the fall of Tenochtitlan. But this is not only a history of colonial domination. It is also a history of resistance. 230 years ago, in 1791, enslaved African workers in the French colony of Saint-Domingue rose up to avenge centuries of enslavement and genocide of African and indigenous people. The Workers' Revolution of Haiti became the first and only successful slave revolt in modern world history. The African Workers' Revolution of Haiti influenced a century of anti-colonial struggles by African and indigenous people in the Americas. This includes the Mexican War for Independence, which concluded with the toppling of Spanish colonial rule in 1821. The struggle for independence of African and indigenous people is on the rise today. This year in Canada and the U.S., the uncovering of mass unmarked graves at mission schools where kidnapped indigenous children were brutalized have prompted the burning of several Catholic churches. Indigenous people throughout the Pacific Northwest are demanding and winning the removal of river dams that have blocked the salmon runs. They're also leading civil disobedience and legal actions to stop the clear-cut logging, oil pipelines, and tar sand mining that have devastated habitat ecology and their centuries-old way of life. At the same time, struggles are raging at the U.S.-Mexico border, where U.S. President Joseph Biden perpetuates use of the COVID pandemic as an excuse to expel or strand over a million people from Mexico, Central America, and South America in unlivable conditions, and U.S. military forces were filmed whipping and chasing Africans from Haiti before flying hundreds who had been living in South America to the earthquake-ravaged Haiti with no means of housing or food. 
Today on Black Power Talks, we say no thanks to colonialism. We'll talk with our guests about the continued anti-colonial struggle within and outside the colonial borders of the United States and the relationship of indigenous, Mexican, and African people. Our first guest is Dr. Jimmy Patino. Dr. Patino holds a PhD in Chicano history from the University of California, San Diego, and is a professor of Chicano and Latino studies at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. A native of Houston, Texas, Dr. Patino's early work was on the Chicano influence in Houston's rap culture. Dr. Patino is deeply interested in the international solidarity between African peoples and Latinos. In 2017, he published Growing Up in the Hood, Same as Me, Black and Brown Hip Hop Subjectivities at an H Town record store. He has published numerous articles and made presentations at many conferences on the history of Mexican, Chicano, and Black people throughout the Southwest. Dr. Patino is the author of the book, Raza Si Migrano, Chicano Movement Struggles for Immigrant Rights in San Diego, which chronicles the activism of Chicano movement activist Herman Baca and the Committee on Chicano Rights, CCR. The CCR was influential in the formation of Union del Barrio. Dr. Patino is joined by Ron Goches, Undersecretary of Union del Barrio in Los Angeles, California. Ron is also a history teacher in South Central Los Angeles. In 2013, he ran for Los Angeles City Council. He currently leads work with the Association of Raza Educators and the Committees of Resistance. Uh-huh. Uh-huh, everybody. Welcome to the show. All right. Thank you for having us. Thank you for the invitation. Much appreciated, Uhuru. Uhuru. Thanks. Thanks. So, Jimmy, welcome back to the show. You're a trained historian, but also more importantly, you know, you're an anti-colonial historian. Can you explain the role that Thanksgiving and similar holidays play in furthering the settler colonial project? Uh, Thank you for that question. And thank you for having me again. It's good to to continue the dialogue. Um, As you mentioned, I'm I'm coming from you from uh, occupied Dakota land, also known as uh, Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, which... Minnesota is a Dakota word itself, which means uh, land uh, where the sky is reflected. Um, um, so, so yeah, so, you know, uh, every locality, I think, in, in the Americas has um, a narrative that works as a linchpin for justifying um, European colonial uh, takeover. Um, and Thanksgiving is another kind of example of that. Um, um, you know, it, it it's interesting coming from Minnesota that um, Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln, um, kind of formally recognized Thanksgiving as a holiday um, because right at the same time when he was doing that, um, one of the largest mass um, lynchings of Native people was occurring um, here in the Dakota War um, in the 1860s. Um, so that kind of demonstrates on the one hand how, you know, Thanksgiving is um, painting a rosy picture of um, European settlers interacting with Native peoples um, while in their actual um, practice, um, they were dislocating and dispossessing uh, Native peoples of their lands. Um, so that's, that's more or less how, you know, it, it, it tends to work as one of the many narratives that exist that justify, um, you know, European colonialism in the Americas. Um, you know, my understanding, you know, another key point is, is um, you know, the Wampanoag people who were the folks who encountered the, the pilgrims. Um, before the arrival of the pilgrims, they had suffered already um, from uh, plagues and, and, and disease that the Europeans had begun to, to circulate in the area. And, you know, that's one thing. It's a material reality. One thing that folks were, you know, exposed to germs and, and, and were, you know, suffering from that. Um, but the ideological justification of it or ideological interpretation of it that someone like John Smith or other settlers had were that God ordained the clearing of the land and um, the, the, the death by disease of Native people. And so, so you know, it's another example of how, again, it's a, it's a linchpin to establish kind of these narratives that, that justify the, the presence and settlement of Europeans at the expense of Native peoples. I appreciate that, Jimmy. 
Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I unite wholeheartedly with that. Um, you know, Ron, so we begin the show talking about a lot of landmarks in the anti-colonial struggle for African indigenous liberation. 2021 also marks another important moment in that struggle, and that's the formation of Union del Barrio in 1981. Union del Barrio has led groundbreaking work in building and leading anti-colonial education and resistance among Mexican people on both sides of the border. How do you view that border and the relationship, with the relationship of what we know as Mexican or Chicano people with what we know as indigenous or First Nations people, as well as with African people? Uhuru, and uh, once again, thank you for the invitation. It's always great for us to, uh, to do this kind of work together, Black and Brown people. Uh, working to educate and you know, inform the masses of some history and, and break down some analysis of this stuff. And so today on, on Thanksgiving, or what you know the imperialists call Thanksgiving, uh, it's important to recap this history because not only is it a history of what happened in the past, but for us in the question about the border, it's a continual history. And that's what we call the border. It's an open wound. It's an open wound um, to our people. And we see that as a division of our people, um, not only physical, but even mental. Uh, where, you know, a lot of people today, um, as one brother said a long time ago at, at Chicano Park, actually in San Diego, he says, uh, you know what a Mexican is? He asked the crowd and the crowd said, what? He's like, do you know what a Mexican is? And he said, it's a confused Indian, meaning, you know, a lot of our people, we, we even forget um, or we, we don't know of our own indigenous past and history and, and roots because of, um, you know, the history of colonization here on this land. And uh, the border is a permanent representation of that. And so when we look at that border, in fact, I just crossed that border um, late last night. Um, you know, every time I cross that border, I think about how it separates our people. Um, but for those of us in the movement, we have to see that that border, although it's a physical separation now, um, the movement, that border cannot stop it. And, you know, as, as a people, as a raza here, we see that this whole struggle um, is continental. And when we say Nuestra America, we say uh, that's that's recognizing our roots on this land and meaning that we are from this land. It's our land. And so as I crossed that border uh, last night, um, you know, we were looking around and then we see we see our people. We saw Haitians who are stuck in Tijuana and many other people are stuck in Tijuana. So it just it's a it's a painful reminder um, that we are still colonized on our own land and the African indigenous people are being uh, continued to be oppressed by that border and that's that's just the reminder of our historical task of not only uh, taking down that border but taking down the system that placed that border there uh, which is a system that keeps uh, black brown and all you know working class people um, down so that that's what that represents for us today oh ron yeah thanks for that because you mentioned nuestra america now can you explain why this is a fundamental concept to a truly anti-colonial, and international struggle for liberation. Yeah, it just, nuestra literally means our, um, and so when we say our America, what we're talking about is that as indigenous people, we recognize ourselves as the people of this continent. And so, you know, we didn't, we didn't, uh, you know, come here from Europe. We didn't come here from nowhere else. This is, this is our historic homeland. And so when we talk about the current political situation, and whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden who are attacking our people with the with the ICE, you know, the Border Patrol, et cetera, uh, they attack us as if we're some type of foreigners, as if we're some type of like invaders coming from somewhere else. When in reality, we're living on our own historic homeland. So when we say Nuestra America, that that takes on, you know, it's ownership of um, of our land uh, that historically we recognize that we we've been here first, and so that's a term that really comes out of uh, Venezuela. And instead of calling it Latin America, which obviously talks about the Latin, you know, European, uh, trying to Europeanize our land, uh, we'd rather use the term Nuestra America. Although we see the contradiction, of course, it's in Spanish, which of course is a, is a colonial language as well. But it's still the point of it is that we recognize the land as, as the land that we come from. And so it's our land. And um, that itself is an anti-colonial term because it's, it's recognizing that we don't recognize uh, the, the Europeans as the owners of this land, but the indigenous people as a true uh, historic, you know, rightful owners of the land. Yeah, huru, huru, huru. I think it also uh, invokes the ideas of uh, Che Guevara, correct? 
Absolutely. Just uh, seeing that it's it's a whole continent that should be uh, united. Of course, when we know when we talk about indigenous people being the first people here, we, we know that. But we know that now there's all kinds of people. And in this history, this long history of anti-colonial struggle, we know that indigenous people, African people, and many others have participated. So this land isn't just saying, hey, it's just ours. Um, we recognize historical ties. Uh, but now we, we know in the year 2021, it's, it's a, it's a multi, multi-ethnic struggle against colonialism and capitalism. And I think that uh, we see that happening throughout Nuestra America in places like Bolivia, Venezuela, uh, where we see uh, black, brown, all kinds of people uniting in struggle. And so that's, that's, the, uh, that's how we see things. And as Che, we'll, we'll see uh, uh, a new society. Um, that's what we're trying to build here on our continent. And we know at the same time we're, we're not alone. And we know that a struggle for us here and a victory for us here will be a victory for all colonized people all over the world. And so that's, uh, it's a struggle for our land here, but it's also a struggle uh, in connection with struggles all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Who Ron? Who Ron? You know, Jimmy, I, I want to go, you know, go back a little bit to what you were speaking as far as the, uh, you know, the ideological significance of uh, Thanksgiving. And, you know, one thing about the Thanksgiving holiday is that it does get married to the notion of manifest destiny. You know, it's no coincidence that the widespread practice of the holiday began in the late 19th century amidst a renewed U.S. attack against the indigenous people of North America. Can you explain Manifest Destiny and describe what is lost when we view history only from that direction? Uh, why is it important for us to understand a more comprehensive timeline that includes a colonial occupation of the Spanish moving from the South and West? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Dexter. Um, yeah, like like I mentioned, uh, you know, Thanksgiving uh, being an ideological narrative, one of many ideological narratives um, that justifies European colonization in the Americas. Um, uh, and to build on some of Ron's insight, uh, thinking about the U.S.-Mexico border, you know, there are, it, it's an opportunity to put it in dialogue with other narratives and that there were multiple colonialisms that were occurring in the Americas. Um, so another kind of narrative that comes to mind is the is the narrative of mestizaje that comes out of the Spanish colonial context in Mexico moving, you know, north into what we call the, the, the U.S.-Mexico borderlands today. Um, and mestizaje being the story of, you, you mentioned Hernán Cortés and the conquest of Tenochtitlan um, in 1521, um, and that he had a uh, Mayan woman named Malincín who was a companion and um, you know, forced to kind of be put in a position to negotiate between the Spanish and and and, and different indigenous nations. Um, you know, Chicano feminists have done a good job of, um, you know, kind of identifying her as kind of navigating a very difficult circumstance. Um, but nonetheless, what the narrative kind of uh, does is create this myth of of a of a kind of happy union of of, of native and in, in this case Spanish European peoples. Um, that create the mestizo, you know, the mixed race uh, kind of uh, Mexican, um, which, as Ron mentioned, is is you know at the at the at the source of kind of the de-indigenization of 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 many Mexican peoples, uh, and so that's that's important to note that um, that de-indigenization, whether it's kind of in the Latin American colonial form of incorporation of and and kind of ideologically. Um, feeding the notion that you're no longer an Indian and that you have become mestizo and become closer to European, um, on the one hand, versus uh, coming from the you know east coast of North America, more of a kind of genocidal, a different kind of genocidal kind of process in which folks were violently attacked and marginalized, um, um, is important to kind of keep in mind and, and, and compare. Um, and so, you know, manifest destiny is is the English U- U.S. kind of a brand of justifying the further march from the East Coast to, uh, again, if God is ordaining the clearing of the land because the Wampanoag have suffered from this uh, pandemic um, and they're finding empty villages on the East Coast, that logic gets reproduced um, as, as you know, uh, English and eventually U.S. based um, elites and, and settlers move move West and encounter other indigenous peoples, um, including um, uh you know, the war with Mexico that occurs, you know, in, in 1846 into 1848. Um, and the, 
the the justification that you know Mexican and indigenous peoples you know do not have the kind of Anglo white ingenuity to kind of develop the land correctly you know which is a major tenet of kind of primitive accumulation in which you know, uh, white elites dispossess native people from land in order to establish and advance the process of a global capitalist economy. And so, you know, this again, God ordained it, right? God ordained this march from the West, which is exactly why we have to dislodge and critique um, these, you know, the, the, the practice holiday of Thanksgiving and, and whatnot. Um, and one result from the U.S.-Mexico war and manifest destiny in regards to Mexican people in particular was that uh, you know, the 100,000 or so Mexican origin peoples who become part of the United States overnight after the conquest of North Mexico um, are established as uh, citizens of the United States through treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And what this treaty does, like Mestizaje, is further de-indigenize Mexican people, right, by making them individual citizens rather than signing a treaty that, you know, recognizes their sovereignty, for instance, like it does with other other native nations, it, it effectively decoupled them from the land and kind of foreignized um, Mexican origin peoples, which is the basis for the idealizer, you know, the ideas that evolve into the border patrol and so-called illegal immigrants and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, so it's really important to put the, the, this larger continental cross colonialism kind of analysis in, in, into practice. Oh, oh, yeah. Thanks for that, Jimmy. Now, Ron, as Jimmy was just talking about, Jimmy mentioned this idea of primitive accumulation. And in short, we know that African and indigenous people were the wealth uh, through which the better life for Europe, European society and white North American society was produced. African indigenous people were, in fact, that primitive accumulation. This really, I think, allows for us to challenge this colonial mythology because we know for a fact that it was the European settlers who made a better life for themselves by taking away that better life for African and indigenous people. So can you let us know, what was life like for indigenous people in North America before the assault of European settler colonialism and other forms of colonial capitalist domination? Uhuru, yeah, thank you for that question. I think that's such an important question because, you know, if you look at the old Hollywood movies, the Western movies, uh, the general thought for American society is that these lands are basically barren, uh, that there was hardly anybody here. You see in these old Western movies, there was like two teepees in the background or something like that. So it made it, it, made it seem as if, as the white folks in Manifest Destiny, you know, uh, moved west, westward, uh, westward, that they really weren't, you know, removing anyone. That's kind of like the the mentality that they have. Uh, but in reality, um, you know, there were millions of people here on this continent, uh, throughout the continent and in the Caribbean. And, you know, we don't want to romanticize or lie about the, the realities, but the realities were that although there were wars, you know, although there were differences among any, any human beings anywhere in the world, you know, we didn't have the, the miserable living conditions that resulted uh, from colonization, from imperialism. Um, you know, we had people who whether we're talking about just here in the Americas, whether we're talking about Africa or Asia, you know, people of color had decent lives. Uh, you know, we, we weren't starving. Uh, we weren't, you know, homeless as we see here today where I live in South Central LA. Man, you can't walk a block anywhere without seeing masses of people uh, living on the streets. That kind of stuff simply didn't exist. Uh, the concept of starvation um, only happened if it was like a massive, some type of, you know, natural disaster or something like that. But in general terms, uh, the people live decent lives. And we didn't need, we didn't need resources from anybody else. We had anything and everything that we needed uh, to survive and to live a decent life. And so with that being said, you know, when we had our own autonomy, when we had uh, the ability to live our lives on our land, to fish, to hunt, to do whatever it was that we needed to do, uh, life was okay. And, you know, history tells us um, that in, on our continent, uh, we've been here for thousands of years before the Europeans and we were just fine. Um, and so once the Europeans arrive, of course, that really flips history, both for the people on this continent and, as you were mentioning, um, the people in Europe. It was as a consequence of the, the pillage, the rape, the murder, uh, the stealing of our land and resources uh, as a consequence of that. That is when you have the birth of you know, the modern day Europe, which is really uh, seen throughout the world as, of course, the, the civilized and the wealthy. 
Um, you know, it's always interesting when I, I talk to my students about, we talk about stuff like, you know, the kids who like soccer. And they say, oh, yeah, I want to play for Barcelona or I want to play for Manchester United or whatever it may be. And I, and I say, you know, why is it that we have to go to these teams way out there to, to make a lot of money? And why is it that they have so much money now? And when we learn a little bit about the history and we see that, man, places like England have no natural resources, basically. And Europe had nothing compared to what people of color had, you know, in Africa, uh, Asia, the Americas, et cetera. And so how is it that they've accumulated so much wealth? And then, of course, throughout the semester in the school years, they learn more about colonization and imperialism and, and you know, the, the, the murder, uh, the mass murder of people and the stealing of, of the wealth that we had. They start to understand how we became impoverished as a result of colonization and how European life increased dramatically, how they, their life improved tremendously as a result of these historical events. And so... For our people, um, you know, again, it's not about romanticizing and trying to go back to living exactly how we once were. It, it, it's not about that, but it's understanding how it is that we got to the point where we are today, where, you know, African people, indigenous people today in this country, for example, you know, we do the hardest jobs. We do the most dangerous jobs, the dirtiest jobs. And yet, economically speaking, we make less than everybody else. How can that be? And so when we understand that, we see how our communities have been extremely impoverished and continue to be, you know, today, if we go to, you know, different uh, indigenous reservations, as you know, Brother Patino was saying in the Dakotas, I mean, many reservations today still don't have running water and electricity. And we're talking about 2021, you know, and it isn't because we're stupid. It isn't because we don't, we don't have any knowledge. It's because a system was imposed on us um, to change our lives, our realities, so that it would improve the lives of the Europeans at the expense of our people. And so that's the reality that we continue to live with today in South Central LA, where I live, you know, it's in, in many other neighborhoods across the country. It's definitely a colonial, it's a colonial reality, a colonial system. Uh, you have the, the majority of people are, you know, black and brown people, but the power structure always benefits, you know, white America. And so it's these, these holidays, man, are painful. They're painful to, to uh, people like us because whether it's the 4th of July and you see all the black and brown folks celebrating with fireworks, whether it's uh, you know days like today when we have these um these these turkey dinners and all this kind of stuff, where it's such a misrepresentation and misunderstanding of history that we really we 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 celebrate our own you know genocide, we celebrate our own um, demise in such a way. But that reminds us of the work that we have to do, that we have to inform our people of the history of these things. And why it is that we shouldn't side with or support colonialism, we should fight it tooth and nail because that's the system that has us where we are in the conditions that we're in today. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, just just your emphasis on um on you know on on colonialism and and, and understanding that the Europe that we see today, the the America that we see today, the Africa, the indigenous lands, everything that we see today is as a result of that rape and pillage of um African and indigenous lands and just you know as far as what you said about that um you know, these conversations between you and, and and students and you know it's really important that we have these conversations you know like you said like the kid would say I want to play for Barcelona well why Barcelona why are they the biggest team it's because they have the most money why do they have the most money when Europe like you said doesn't have any natural resources and it's just I really appreciate you having these conversations and asking these questions because you know it helps these help everybody able to you know kind of go upstream and really get to the source of it all the root of it all which is colonialism so yeah thank you for that um comrade uh jimmy uh you've been doing a lot of new research on indigenous resistance to to colonialism can you explain some important moments of resistance that we rarely learn about Thank you for that question um I appreciate that because as we've been you know discussing you know colonial ideological linchpins um, and narratives like Thanksgiving, like Mestizaje. Um, we can think of things like Pocahontas, uh, that narrative that is, is spread to children uh, day in and day out. Um, it's also important to think about uh, the counter narratives, the, the anti-colonial narratives that, that, that exist. Um, you know, going back to um, the, the war with Mexico that the U.S. engaged in the mid-19th century, um, to contextualize, you know, kind of one thread of Mexican independence as calling for abolition, right? Calling for abolition of slavery, calling for kind of a redistribution of land, addressing the dispossession of, of, of Native peoples. 
um, and, and putting that in an internationalist context, right? The, 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 the struggle for abolition in the 19th century was a global uh, phenomenon, was a global clash um, and struggle um, of which, you know, Mexico, Mexican independence movement was, you know, on the side of, of abolishment in the face of the slave imperialist um, entity of the United States, which, of course, starting with Texas and 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 moving west, right, began to impose um, enslavement. Um, this is, you know, a key reason why white uh, settlers in Texas revolt against Mexico because Mexico is seeking to abolish slavery um, and they want to keep the, the slave system. Um, so that's one kind of narrative that puts it in dialogue with, you know, the revolution in Haiti, um, with other abolitionist kind of processes that are ongoing um, in the U.S. Of course, someone like Frederick Douglass was deeply critical of the war with Mexico um, because of its imperialist kind of uh, uh, impetuses, right? Um and so, so yeah, so just locating these different kind of kind of narratives are 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 significant. Um, I guess my research more bringing that into the 20th century, and, and I kind of alluded to this after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, kind of the decoupling of of Mexican people from the land, and kind of the imposition of the notion that somehow Mexicans who preceded white Americans in this in in this part of the world um, became foreign. And um, this is this is you know a, a a serious jack move by colonizers to kind of within year within a couple of years of taking over land from that Mexicans you know occupied um, to, to to make the move informal policy to call them foreigners right the foreign miners tax for instance and, and during the gold rush in the in the Bay Area um, um, after the U.S. Mexico War and so how that and how that evolves and you know solidifies into uh, this border policing. Um, that exists and that emerges as deportation regime, as some of some of us call it, um, that just takes different kind of colonial categories and creates new ones. Like illegal alien was the was the was invented in the 1920s to you know justify um, really the, the the capitalist exploitation of of Mexican labor. Um, you know, kind of a new way of trying to to you know manage. That that system and be able to deport and 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 ex, you know uh, expel um, Mexican workers when they you know get uppity or start to ask for rights or wages or whatnot. Um, so that's something that I've I've worked on and and you know brought into you know the, another you know another set of narratives that are important is our, our Chicano power in the 1960s, Black Power, Red Power, um, doing some work on the coexistence of red, black, and brown power in somewhere like here in the Twin Cities that existed in the 1960s um, to, 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 to demonstrate how black, brown, and indigenous people, you know, um, resisted, not only resisted and, and, and countered some of the narratives, ideological narratives that existed, um, but built infrastructures to, you know, solve our own problems. Um, you know, um, you know the Brown Berets existed here in St. Paul, um, Minnesota, um, and they their primary goal was to keep the community safe, part primarily from the police, um, but also you know uh, in, in terms of inter residential violence um, that existed um, in, through gangs and through other kind of um, uh, manifestations. And, and their argu argument was, of course, that you know the the real the real solution to violence in our own communities is to de eradicate poverty. Um, and so they had a number of different programs, you know, focused on youth, um, taking youth into uh, into into nature to dialogue with other other peoples um, to, you know, kind of uh, engage in job training type programs, um, unionization type things. And, of course, um, cultural uplift um, in response to the colonial narratives that, you know, kind of uh, seek to subjugate Mexican peoples. Um, and so, so those are, those are a couple of things that, that, that I'm working on right now. Thank you. Thank you. And then just to go, you know, a little further into this, um, uh, what do you know about, you know, some of the popular revolts of indigenous people, like the Yuma revolt, the Pueblo revolt and the uh, revolt at the mission San Diego? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as I've, you know, I've taught early Chicano history for, for a good while now. And, you know, this, this past semester, I, I, focused more, you know, began to focus on kind of indigenous people who um, 
existed kind of outside and around um, the Spanish um, settlements like San Diego, like Santa Fe, like San Antonio. Um, uh, because one narrative exists in Chicano history that kind of centers, you know, the process of, of kind of the Spanish and, and the process of incorporating indigenous peoples and, you know, again, engaging in this uh, social system of mestizaje where you de-Indianize uh, the people, um, which is important, right? But at the same time, um, there were indigenous people like, like, like the Ute peoples, um, like the Comanche, like the Apache, uh, and like the Pueblo, who um, continued to, to to maintain their you know um, you know national integrity, um, for lack lack of a better word, um, in the face and you know kind of struggling against Spanish imposition. So we really focused on the Pueblo revolt um, in the 1690s, where um, you know the the Pueblo peoples, of course, expelled the Spaniards from New Mexico for, you know, more than a decade. Um, and, uh, to, you know, to note that and to celebrate that is, is particularly significant. Um, and it's also significant because it demonstrates a form of solidarity that existed in terms of, you know, you have Pueblo peoples fighting against the Spanish, but you also had so-called Spanish speaking mestizo peoples who sided with the Pueblo in this regard. And maybe this is a way of re-indigenizing that occurs during the Pueblo revolt, where um, this anti-colonial uh, tradition is is initiated um, amongst you know indigenous people who had been Hispanicized um, and, and, and siding with the pueblo in that regard. So so that's been a really important kind of site of of um, exploration of different forms of of resistance. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate that, and I just you know just appreciate you just going to all these different instances that just show that you know colonized people um, have always resisted colonial domination tooth and nail. So I appreciate, you know, some of these um, stories, some of these uh, struggles that haven't, you know, received, you know, quote unquote, mainstream attention. I appreciate you bringing them to light and just, you know, getting into all these ongoing, ongoing struggles. Uhuru. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today we are saying no thanks to colonialism. Our guests today are Jimmy Patino and Ron Gulches. Uhu, Ron. For over 35 years, our organizations, the African People's Socialist Party and Union de Barrio, have maintained a fraternal bond grounded in the revolutionary principles of internationalism, anti colonialism, and self determination of African and indigenous people. Upon completion of the Haitian Revolution, Jean Jacques Dessalines stated, Yes, I have saved my country. I have avenged America. Saint-Domingue, an island country then inhabited by Africans, brought in to replace the indigenous population that had been decimated by the Spanish, was renamed IET, the name given to the island by its original custodians, the Arawak people. Can you tell us what is the importance of African and indigenous solidarity in this anti-colonial struggle? Yeah, man, this is a this is something that I sometimes when I teach this stuff, it, it amazes me that I get paid to teach this stuff because when when our youth learn about this stuff, um, and again, as I mentioned before, I teach in South Central LA, so you know, a hundred percent of my students are black and brown. That's all we have in our neighborhood, and so when I teach this stuff, and and the students learn about the history of not only uh, similarities in our history and struggle, but of the joint nature of our struggle and how we struggle together. It's something that excites them, and they always want to know more about it. And so, this solidarity um, of working together is something that is is not new at all. Uh, whether we go back into you know uh, Mexico when it was uh, with uh, some of the leaders of the Mexican independence movement, uh, Vicente Guerrero, etc., uh, we see uh, black and brown people fighting together in Mexico against the Spaniards to to liberate Mexico from Spanish domination. Or whether it was, uh, as Brother Patino was saying a little bit earlier, in, in the 60s and 70s with like the Black Panthers and the, uh, the Chicano Power Movement, where there was a lot of uh, times where those, those struggles uh, you know, linked up. Um, there's so many examples of this solidarity. Um, I, I read, I remember when I was in college, of this plan called the Plan de San Diego uh, in Texas, where the plan was for uh, Africans, uh, indigenous people, Mexican people to unite uh, and, and to start a rebellion in Texas against, against Americans. And so this, this history of working together 
is so important because when we learn this history of of uh, you know of a common struggle and how the kind of as, as the saying says you know the same dog that bit you bit me we see that instead of fighting each other as we do see in our communities you know there are black and brown tensions um, as we see that when we learn this history of how we have every reason to struggle together instead of fighting against each other uh, we see that we have everything to gain from uniting our struggles uh, we have everything to lose by fighting each other and so there are so many uh, rich examples throughout history of our people struggling together um, that you know obviously these things for the most part are left out of your general US history textbooks um, you know the man doesn't want us to know that we've have struggled together and that we fought on the same side so many times. They don't want us to know that because obviously it doesn't serve the interest of white power. And, you know, for us that are lucky enough to be educators, uh, I guess formal educators, we have to do everything in our power to get this history, this unknown, this buried history um, out into, into our students, into our communities so that they, they know the importance of this. Look, the truth is, we, we can't win these, solid, these struggles of liberation on our own. Uh, we need to unite forces uh, with any and all people who are sincere about trying to fight against colonization, imperialism, and in economically speaking, capitalism. Uh, we need to fight together because our enemy is strong, very strong, and they have all of our money. And so they're, they're well-funded. They're, they work 24 hours a day uh, to keep, you know, uh, us at the bottom and themselves at the top. So unless we can build uh, a true revolutionary movement one day where we unite forces, uh, that's the only chance we have. And we're going to have to fight this thing. There's no way. There's no way we're going to liberate ourselves through voting for a Democrat. There's no way we're going to liberate ourselves from simply doing marches. You know, it took brutal and savage violence uh, to colonize us. And our colonizers today, they may look a little different from back in those days, or maybe not so different, um, but they ain't going to give up the riches that they have that they took from us. So if we want liberation, uh, we're going to have to uh, do some serious, serious organizing, do serious, uh, you know, uh, informing our people like we're doing now in this um, in this podcast. And that, that leads to a bigger struggle of liberation, you know, and there's different fronts in the, in the work that we do. You know, some of us are teachers, some of us, you know, uh, you know, are write books. There's different roles that we all can play uh, to inform our people of the only way that we have to free ourselves um, is, is through united struggle. And so that's why I think this that we're doing right now is so powerful that we're uniting, you know, the work of, of the African People's Socialist Party, Union del Barrio, different social movements um, that need to unite in order for us to, to win our freedom. Oh, 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 yeah, thanks for that. It's absolutely uh, paramount. It's the only way uh, it's going to happen. We talked about uh, African and, and indigenous people being the pedestal through which colonial capitalism was produced. And we know as African people and indigenous people rise up, that pedestal becomes shaky. That's the origins of that colonial capitalist, that imperialism in crisis. Uh, so we have to, uh, you know, push and demand increasingly that we stand up and uh, reclaim our own uh, humanity. Uh, so just a brief follow up, Jimmy, your work has influenced my own research and even ideological development. In many ways, it serves as a precursor to uh, some of the stuff that Ron was also just talking about. You write about the connections between anti-apartheid movement and the immigration struggles in San Diego. Can you briefly talk about that perspective that you put forward in your book, Raza C. Nigrano? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that, Michael. Yeah, and that's, a, that's exactly one moment um, of Black-Brown solidarity that I thought of um, as as we you know continue to discuss uh, you know the significance of 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 that form of of, of working together to 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 address uh, uh, the you know the capitalist social system um, and yeah in in San Diego um, in the late seventies as the uh, policing of the border became you know a federal a national level kind of debate and became quite frankly much more violent 
Um, I mean, it's it's permanently violent, but the the violent was heightened uh, to the to the point of um, you know children losing their lives, um, you know, uh, uh, folks, you know, being uh, you know detained um, and and whatnot. And um, in that context, uh, because of the shared reality of kind of police violence against both black and brown communities. Um, <clears throat> groups like the Committee on Chicano Rights um, began a dialogue with and to work with um, groups um, groups uh, like the, uh, the the group NIA, the NIA organization, um, which was a you know black power organization um, based in Southeast San Diego, and you know through through this dialogue um, and through this kind of solidarity work, um, which really I, I think began with the shared experience of police violence against both black and brown people, the, these groups of folks began to develop kind of analysis, kind of grassroots organic theoretical understandings of, of how the system kind of pits black and brown people against each other. And, and importantly, the ways in which there's a shared struggle. And so, so part of that became when Nia, you know, began to take positions in which um, they, you know, uh, supported the Committee on Chicano Rights analysis of the immigration system as a form of exploitation, um, as a form of, you know, uh, descendant from the slave system to try to create a rightless worker that's easier to to exploit and, and to avoid the, you know, uh, story of that immigrants are taking jobs from black folks. I mean, that's a, you know, that's a colonial narrative uh, that continues to exist today. And so it's important that this solidarity was enacted um, and, and these ideas emerged that we can still utilize today to make sense of, of the conflicts that the, the system you know, uses to pit black and brown folks against one another. Um, and of course, in, in response to that, the Committee on Chicano Rights uh, supported Nia's uh, criticism and activism uh, against the apartheid regime in South Africa as they you know, uh, pressured uh, the, the city of San Diego and other entities to divest from South African um, interest and and you know, business uh, businesses, um, the the CCR um, you know I, identified with that, um, signed on to petitions and marched with um, with uh, Nia uh, against uh, the, the apartheid system and even made an interesting connection that you know the future of the U.S. Southwest you know. South Africa could could be a uh, a devastating kind of model and parallel in terms of the majority of the peoples controlled by a tiny white elite, um, and so so yeah, these connections were made, and I think again these ideas are crucial and still useful today as we as we continue to to to, to struggle against the system. Horrible. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So so Ron. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the work that Onion Barrio is doing on, on the ground. So in Los Angeles, uh, Onion Barrio organizes resistance committees. Can you explain the importance of the resistance committees as a continuance of this history of anti-colonial resistance? And can you say how some people can get involved? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that question. So going back to the, you know, the issue of uh, black and brown unity and knowing of each other's struggles in history, um, you know, we know about the the community patrols that the uh, the Black Panthers used to do uh, back in the '60s in places like Oakland and LA, where you know the Panthers would jump into their cars and they would patrol their community uh, and looking out for any type of police terrorism, any type of threats against the Black community. So you know, we learned from that, and so we said, hey, why don't we do that in our neighborhood? So Unión del Barrio has started doing this. Of it started doing this a few years ago now. Uh, it started in San Diego, where our comrades down there uh, get in their vehicles early in the morning. And they patrol different neighborhoods in San Diego because, of course, being by the border, there's a much there's a much heavier presence of not just ICE, but of course, Border Patrol uh, and other uh, militarized units in our communities. And so we know that ICE carries out their deportation raids uh, early in the morning, you know, five, six in the morning. They do it when people are asleep. Uh, so when they go to your house and try to kidnap you, your neighbors are asleep and they don't even see, so they can't even try to help you. Um, so that's why. Union del Barrio started doing these patrols where we start training ourselves on how to identify, you know, undercover vehicles, how to identify uh, these operations that take place in our neighborhood. 
And so we started to, to train ourselves in order to, be, to protect our community. And so uh, that started a few years ago. They've been doing them in San Diego very successfully. Uh, they've been going and patrolling the neighborhoods. They've encountered ICE activity many times. And when they do encounter it, uh, they, they alert the community we, you know, blow, uh, with blow horns, you know, megaphones, whatever, whatever they can to let them know that ICE is in the area and they're trying to kidnap people in the area. So, it's, you know, we want our people to stay indoors, close your door, don't talk to nobody, you know, don't talk to the cops, don't talk to the ICE agents, et cetera. And so in Los Angeles, we started doing that uh, about a year ago now as well. So we patrol our, our community. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science. We get in cars, uh, we have radios, uh, we've done some training, um, and we identify, uh, you know, possible threats to our community. And so we put up flyers everywhere uh, with our information. So if people on the street see any, you know, activity that might be a threat to our community, they call us and we go and investigate. And so here in South Central, we've been, we've been doing these now. Um, and it, it's, man, we documented this and people can check it out on our Facebook page on Unión del Barrio or the Comités de Resistencia, where we've had now, you know, black and brown patrols. So we have uh, African and uh, indigenous people getting in our cars. Uh, being on radios, patrolling South Central, and looking out for any type of attack against our community. And if we could do that all throughout this country, just imagine how much better we could be in terms of, uh, you know, the community self-defense. But now it allowing, not allowing the state to kidnap our people, to, to brutalize our people, to murder our people. You know, we've seen the video uh, of Brother George Floyd being killed. Um, and we see this often where people videotape these attacks, but when are we going to get to the point where we don't just record it with our phones, but we actually take action and prevent the pigs from killing our people. And, you know, community self-defense is just that it's self-defense. So, uh, that's what the Comites de Resistencia are trying to do. We've been doing this in San Diego, East LA, Boyle Heights, South Central. We want to spread this everywhere. Um, and I think that it's something that people can get involved in. Uh, if they don't live in those in those neighborhoods, that's fine. We can still do training, you know, through Zoom or whatnot, uh, so that people can start doing these patrols in your own community um, to to defend the the well being of our people. Because we're under attack in every single way, uh, whether it's the police, whether it's ICE, whether it's these gentrifiers trying to kick us out of our neighborhoods. Um, if we organize, we can defend ourselves. The history tells us that we've done it, and uh, that we have no other way. Obviously, we're not going to depend on the Republicans or the Democrats uh, or the gentrifiers to, to, to work in the best interest of our community. So we have to do it ourselves. And so that's what the Comités de Resistencia do. And uh, we're going to continue to hopefully expand into other neighborhoods pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, you're absolutely right. And I really want to salute that work being done. You know, our communities are under assault, whether it's talking about the gentrifiers or or police or, you know, any any force entity that's encroaching on our community. So, you know, the work you're doing there is, is, is crucial. And also, comrades, uh, we at the end of the episode. I really want to appreciate you both uh, for being on here. Really want to appreciate your expertise um, in your fields and just appreciate your um, your commitment to being on the ground and unfolding the struggle. So I want to appreciate you both for being on the show with us, comrades. Uhuru, comrades, again, thank you for the invite. We're always willing to work together, struggle together, fight together. Uh, we're in this uh, to liberation. Thank you, comrades. Yes, indeed. African indigenous <clears throat> solidarity. Uhuru. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Uh, thanks for the dialogue. Uh, thanks for the analysis. Um, it's it's great to learn what folks are doing in different parts of the continent. Um, and just a quick note on 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 the day of thanks taking and where people are consuming so much food to, to to continue to stay focused on the exploitative nature in which food is delivered to us, particularly on Mexican, Central American, and other kinds of of workers. Um, so I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, fellas. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to having you both on the show in the future. Whenever, just let us know. Definitely. You have been listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today we are saying no thanks to colonialism. Our guests today were Jimmy Patino and Ron Goches. Our theme song, Get Up and Do Something, was written and performed by Alikia Ngoma. Thanks to the Black Power Talk Show's production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, Empress Livewire, and a hipster panda. You can pray until you faint, but if 
you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And there's no need of running and no need of saying, honey, I'm